All right, so we're on our last chapter for Chem 110. This is an introduction to biochemistry. I apologize because we're going to cover a lot of material really quickly in this chapter, but I just want you to focus primarily on the concepts and terminology. I'm not going to push the chemistry too heavily. So this is kind of the crossover between biology and chemistry. Yeah, the general terms and concepts could be on the final. However, if you've taken any biology courses, this will seem very familiar for you. All right, so biochemistry is pretty interesting. It's the chemistry whoops, behind living things and their processes. I remember one term my old instructor used to tell me, um, she said, biology is really chemistry, chemistry is really physics, and physics is really math. I'm not sure if some of you have heard that, but I really believe that's true. If you understand biology really well, you're at heart a chemist. Um, biochemistry deals with a whole bunch of biomolecules. These are the most important molecules in your body, arguably, outside of water. Does anybody know the main classes of biomolecules? Start throwing out some. Think about food labels. That might be a good hint. Soaking oil. Soaking oil. oil. <laughs> yep. So that's a type of lipid or a fat. All right. What else might you see on a food label that's really important in terms of biology? Proteins. Proteins. You said sugar. Sugar, absolutely. These are called uh, carbohydrates. So when you look on a food label, you normally see fat, proteins, carbohydrates. Those are the big ones that uh, provide us with energy. And we also use them to build up um, various structures in our body. There's one last one that's used for coding genetic information, and that's referred to as nucleic acids. There's a bunch more, but these are the main four that we're going to be focusing on that many of you will need to know for your biology classes later on. So let's start with carbohydrates, and then we'll work our way um, down to nucleic acids um, at the very end. So let's do carbohydrates. Like I said, a sugar is essentially a carbohydrate. However, these sugars can be linked up together to form chains, almost like a polymer, and so we'll talk about the difference between um, different carbohydrates. So the first one that we're going to talk about is a monosaccharide. And what do you think a monosaccharide is based on the prefix? It's one sugar. So it's one sugar unit. We also run into disaccharides, and we'll talk about those next. And based on the prefix, what do you think that is? <laughs> Two sugar units. <laughs> All right, and then last but not least, we've got something called a polysaccharide. Oh. Did I spell that right? I think I forgot an H. Sorry. And a polysaccharide, as you can probably tell by the prefix, is many sugars all linked together into a polymer. So it's a sugar polymer. And if you're familiar with nutrition, this provides you a lot of energy when you digest these. However, not all sugars are digestible. Yep. Not quite. To be a polymer, I'm not sure what the cutoff is, but you have to have quite a few repeating units, not just two. That's a good question. All right, so we've got a bunch of different saccharides, especially monosaccharides, that we'll encounter in biology classes or in day-to-day -day life. However, I'm not going to go through all of those. There's literally dozens of them. Instead, we're going to focus on the main three. First one is glucose. Most of you are familiar with glucose, so if you're a diabetic, you have to actually check your blood sugar levels. 
that's checking for free glucose in your blood. That's an energy source for your body, right? You don't want to have too much of it in your blood or else it's really hard on your kidneys. If you have too much, um, your liver should be storing that and regulating how much of it's um, being released into your bloodstream. Uh, there's also galactose and fructose. Those are common ones. Many of you have probably heard about high fructose corn syrup. That just means it's got a higher percentage of fructose in that um, uh, syrup than normal table sugar. Uh, normal table sugar still has fructose in it, which is something that a lot of people don't know. So fructose in and of itself isn't bad for you, but like most things, you don't want a lot of it or else it'll throw your body out of whack a little bit. Galactose is found in a bunch of different um, disaccharides and polysaccharides. We'll take a look at that next, actually. Um, so for the final exam, I want you to memorize all of these sugars and their names um, and be able to draw them um, from memory. That's a joke. <laughs> I do the same thing to my organic class, and they all look at me like terrified. They're like, seriously, you want to? No. Um, I just want you to be familiar with some of the common names that you might see in biology. And remember that these ones that we're seeing, the top three, are individual sugars, meaning they're a monosaccharide. They're by themselves. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I've got a weird sense of humor. All right, next, let's look at disaccharides. <laughs> Making enemies today. And disaccharides, like I said, are two sugars that are linked together. Specifically, they're linked with a special bond. And these bonds are called glycosidic bonds. And they're that point of connection between two individual sugars. So let's try to highlight where the glycosidic bonds are in these various sugars. So the one on the far left, all you have to do is find that point where they link together. You see that? That's a glycosidic bond. For this one over here, that's a glycosidic bond. And for this one here, that's a glycosidic bond. It's just that point of linkage. The sugar on the far left, that disaccharide, we've got two sugars linked together. This is referred to as maltose. What do you think maltose is found in? Pretty interesting. Has anybody ever done home brewing? So if you've ever home brewed or if you ever decide to do that in the future, what you do is you take malted barley and you actually make something called wort, where you basically make this soup of barley grains. Um, and when you do that, you release a bunch of maltose in there. And then that maltose gets fermented into alcohol, right? So it's actually found in malt, which is where the name maltose comes from. So malted barley. The next one we have is sucrose. That's common table sugar. So sucrose, most of you have in your kitchen. It's kind of interesting with uh, sucrose. What you have is this sugar over here on the left-hand side. This is glucose, that sugar we just saw. And then on the right-hand side, you've got a second sugar that's been linked to glucose, and this is fructose. So when you have a disaccharide, it doesn't have to be the exact same sugar. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. You can have any combination of various sugars that are linked together to form a disaccharide. The last one that we have is lactose. Where is lactose found? What was that? Milk, exactly. So people often call this milk sugar. And lactose is pretty interesting. It has one sugar here. I'll highlight that in red. This is called galactose. You don't have to memorize these, don't worry. And this one over here is glucose. One thing you might notice between common table sugar and milk sugar is the linkage is slightly different. Do you see how in common table sugar, the linkage from glucose is kind of pointed down, where with milk sugar, it's pointed up? Which one's easier to digest for most people, common table sugar or milk sugar? Table sugar, right? 
How many of you have heard of lactose intolerance, right? Essentially what happens is your body is okay handling milk sugar when you're young because you're nursing, you're drinking a lot of milk. However, if you stop drinking milk, just cold turkey stop, eventually your body kind of forgets how to metabolize those milk sugars. You get pretty sick if you start to try eating uh, dairy products later on. In fact, it's pretty interesting if you go to um, Southeast Asia, the vast majority of people in Southeast Asia are lactose intolerant because they just don't eat that much dairy in Southeast Asia. Um, it's kind of interesting. Is that the only way that happens? Some people genetically just have a predisposition to being lactose intolerant too, um, and that basically means they lack the enzyme to cleave that bond, and we'll talk about enzymes later. But most of these disaccharides, when they're metabolized, you snip that glycosidic linkage, you get free sugars, and then your body metabolizes those free sugars. Make sense? All right, we've also got to consider some of the common polysaccharides. So I'll show you these. Don't worry about writing them down. You're welcome to pull this up on OneNote later, too, if you just want to review the notes and see all the highlighting as well. But like I said, a polysaccharide is a polymer of a bunch of individual sugars. So for example, here I've got a glucose unit. That's a monomer. Here, I've got a second glucose, third glucose, fourth glucose. This can go on in a big, 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 long chain. All right, in addition, we wanna identify the glycosidic bonds linking the sugars together. So we'll go ahead and highlight those. See a glycosidic bond there. See a glycosidic bond there. And I see a glycosidic bond there. Let's go back up and look at the milk sugar though. If you look at the milk sugar, you know how I said the glycosidic bond was kind of pointed up and it's harder for people to digest it? Do you think we're going to have an easy time digesting this polymer? Well, without looking at the name, you can look at that glycosidic bond. They're all pointed up, right? These are called beta-linked. And what that means is that the glycosidic bond points up, not down, and these are hard to digest. All right, so the name of this polymer, this polymer of sugars is cellulose. Where's cellulose found? Does anybody know? Plant, specifically plant cell walls. They provide structural support for plants, things like that. However, a lot of animals can eat cellulose, so like a cow eats grass, and they're able to get sugar out of that. How does that work? Multiple stomachs, yeah, it's pretty interesting. So the cool thing with cows is what they do is they eat grass, it's full of cellulose. They can't digest the cellulose, but they've got a ton of bacteria in their first stomach, and the bacteria can digest cellulose. So they have this symbiotic relationship with their gut bacteria, the gut bacteria snips all of those glycosidic bonds and then it moves it to the next stomach where they can digest it. Um, it's pretty interesting. One obscure fact that I didn't know is that it's actually linked to global warming. Um, when cows do this process, the bacteria emits methane and that methane is a super potent greenhouse gas and the cows burp it out. So cow burps are actually a big problem globally. <laughs> So what they're trying to do now is to try to add some sort of food additive or genetically engineered bacteria or special bacteria that don't uh, emit methane or as much methane during that uh, fermentation process. It's kind of weird. Uh, there's also other animals that eat grasses. Has anybody had a pet rabbit before? Yeah, I'm gonna gross some of you out that haven't had a pet rabbit, but what did you notice about your pet rabbit? It pooped a lot? Did it eat its poop? You didn't notice it? <laughs> so the weird thing with rabbits is rabbits will eat cellulose. They can't digest the cellulose. It goes straight through them. So they poop out these pellets that are basically undigested cellulose. Then what happens is bacteria collects on their poop. The bacteria snips all of those glycosidic bonds. And then they eat their poop to absorb that sugar. So it's kind of weird. Uh, rabbits are referred to as hindgut fermenters. So a lot of animals have actually adapted 
to be able to digest cellulose, human beings really are crummy at it, so we just don't eat much cellulose or else it passes through us. Yep. Yeah, so your dog or cat, they don't have that hindgut fermenting feature. Instead, they usually just get sick and puke. So from what I've heard for dogs and cats is they normally will do that when they're actually trying to puke. So maybe they have something upsetting their stomach and they're like, you know what, I just want to purge right now. I'm going to eat some grass. Yep. We're not going to get into it too much, but let's compare it to the nut sugar, and then that'll hopefully make more sense. Yep. So why, why is it that the direction That's a really good question. So we have enzymes in our body that basically are these proteins, right? And they can snip bonds. However, they can only snip certain shapes of bonds. And in this case, it's just not the right shape for our enzymes. Bacteria do have enzymes that can snip these bonds. We just don't. Yep. So let's compare this to another polysaccharide. This polysaccharide, if we look at it, still is glucose, repeating over and over and over again. And we've got this glycosidic bond right here. But this time, do you notice how each of these bonds isn't pointed up? Instead, it's pointed straight down. This is called alpha-linked. That means your glycosidic bond points down. And I'm going to put down in quotes because obviously that depends on your perspective. And these are relatively easy to digest. All right, so the polymer that we have shown here structurally is very, very similar to cellulose, but the linkage is pointed in a slightly different direction. Does anybody know a common name for this polymer that's easy to digest? It's a big, long polymer of sugars. Starch. So this is closely linked to starch. Where do we find starches? <laughs> potatoes. Yeah, so potatoes, pastas, things like that. They have a lot of carbohydrates in them that are polymers, but they're linked in a special way that makes it easier for us to digest them. Um, versus cellulose, that just goes straight through you because your body doesn't know what to do with it. Um, the other interesting thing in biology is we like to store sugar, um, primarily because we were hunter-gatherers for a long time. We didn't constantly have access to a food source. Does anybody know where we store these big, long polymers of sugars? Not in fat. Fat's a little bit different. If you have enough sugar, it will get converted to fat. But what about like medium-term storage? glycogen, or it gets stored in your liver. So what I've got here is, this is the same thing as a starch derivative, but this is referred to as glycogen. And I'm just going to write down, it's a glucose polysaccharide stored in your liver. The difference between glycogen and starch is you can tell it's got a lot of branching going on there, right? So it is highly branched. So essentially, if you don't have enough free sugar in your body, your metabolism will say, hey, let's pull some of this out of your liver, start metabolizing it, and up your blood sugar level. Um, the big problem, like I said, is with diabetes, you lose that regulatory control in your body. Your body doesn't know how much sugar you should have in your bloodstream, and that's when you get all sorts of health problems. Diabetes is a really serious disease, um, so it's something you've got to pay close attention to and try to regulate your blood sugar. That way you don't develop it later in life. Are there any questions with these polymers? No? All right, let's move on to fats or lipids for our next section. And these are pretty interesting. Like I said, many of you pointed out that sugar, if you have enough of it in your body, your body will put it away for ultra long-term storage and convert it to a fat. 
However, not all fats or lipids are classified the same way. So we'll take a look at a few different types. But the easiest way to define a fat or lipid is whether or not it mixes with water. Do you think a fat will mix with water? No. So they are insoluble in water. Unlike a sugar, right? A sugar will mix into water usually pretty well. And do you think they have uh, any hydrogen bonding in them? Or what sort of intermolecular force do you think they primarily have? Dispersion forces, right? So if they're not mixing with water, that means they probably don't have H bonding. So they probably have dispersion forces. So they have large hydrophobic region. with London dispersion forces. And that's why they don't mix very well with water. So we'll take a look at a typical triglyceride. And we actually saw this in lab, but I'll write it out again. And we had this backbone with oxygens coming off of it. And then we had these big long chains. I'm just going to say CH2X, meaning that unit can repeat many, many, many times. carbon there. So this would be a typical triglyceride. Essentially what this means is that you've got three units coming off of it, hence the tri and the triglyceride, and each of these are fatty acid residues. Why do you think we call them fatty? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> We're shaming it, yeah. We're telling it to lose some weight. It's like, come on, you just need one of them, not all three. The main reason they're called fatty acid residues is they've got a really, really, really long carbon chain, right? And that long carbon chain has London dispersion forces. It doesn't want to mix with water, so we call it a fat, right? So a fatty acid. The acid portion, some people ask about, they'll say, well, why do we call this an acid? And this makes sense when we think about this in lab. So in lab, what we did was we treated this with a strong base. And we got this, whoops, that should just be CH. We got this molecule called glycerol that's found in consumer products. And then we also created a carboxylic acid derivative, specifically we made three of these, so I'll just put times three, and this because it's a carboxylic acid derivative, is referred to as a fatty acid. So what you can do, which we saw in lab, is you can take fats like a simple triglyceride, you can treat it with a strong base, and what did we make? Soap. We made soap, exactly. So fats and soaps are closely related to one another. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, we also, I thought it was oil. Yeah, so let's take a look at how soap works really quick, and we'll just briefly do this. Um, I'm actually going to scoot this over here just so I have enough room for everything else. So let's say I've got, I'm going to cheat and use the power of technology, if it'll let me. Just one second. 
<laughs> so let's say I'm looking at three soap molecules over here and I've got, whoa, and I've got a blob of oil floating around. So I'm gonna draw a big red oil blob. <laughs> Just to clarify. And each one of these, right, these long tails are attracted to oil. And why is that? They have similar, similar intermolecular forces, right? So that tail has London dispersion forces, and the oil has London dispersion forces. So basically, this will wrap up that entire oil blob into a big three-dimensional sphere. And then on this side, over here, we've got the carboxylic acid ends. And this is really attracted to water. So water will snuggle up close to those carboxylic acids, and that allows the oil to mix with water really well. And that, if you remember from your lab handout, is called an emulsion. That's why soaps work really well, is one half of them is attracted to water, the other half is attracted to oil, and that complementary feature allows them to mix well. Make sense? Okay. All right, so let's take a look at some common types of fats. All right, we've got a handful of different ones, so I'm going to put saturated over here, and we'll put unsaturated over here. And I believe we talked about this during our organic chemistry section. So what does it mean if something's saturated? Full of yeah, it's full of hydrogen. Does it have single bonds, double bonds, or both? Single bonds. Okay, so only single bonds. Actually, let's specify this. Only carbon-carbon single bonds. And unsaturated means, conversely, it's not full of hydrogens. What sort of bonds do they have? Double bonds. So they have one or more CC double bond. I'm sure many of you have noticed on food labels too, you might see a line listing of mono unsaturated fats. What do you think that means? means you just have one double bond as opposed to many double bonds. So monounsaturated fats just have one CC double bond. Polyunsaturated fats have more than one. Um, there's a bunch of different fat types, but before we get to that, let's think about the properties of each of these. So let's think about saturated fats. Are saturated fats normally solids or liquids? Solids. So the thing I always think of is if you've ever cooked a meat product, right? And then you let your pan hang out for the rest of the evening, you probably get that solidified goo. That's mostly saturated fats. So saturated fats are commonly found in animal products. So things like butter are saturated, things like um, uh, beef fat is saturated. Um, there's some other ones as well. However, for the most part, saturated fats tend to be solids. Unsaturated fats, on the other hand, tend to be liquids. And what's a good example of an unsaturated fat? Olive oil, yeah. So olive oil is usually um, unsaturated, meaning it has some double bonds in there. Vegetable oil, same thing like that. The main difference between these is when you're saturated and full of hydrogen, it allows those molecules to pack really tightly, almost like a brick wall, right? So if they pack up tightly, they're gonna behave like a solid. Where the unsaturated bonds You've got these kinks in their tail where the double bond's forcing them to not be a straight line. That doesn't allow them to pack very well and leads to them acting more like liquids. Does anybody remember, too, with this double bond? Is the double bond cis or trans? 
give you a hint, which fat is bad for you? Cis or trans fats? Trans fats are bad for you, right? We've heard a lot about that in the news. Trans fats are bad for your heart, which means most natural double bonds are cis. So it is important to remember that too. Here's a list of some fatty acids that you might run into. So the first one only has four carbon atoms in its tail. That's called butyric acid. Why is it called butyric acid? Bute, right? So bute indicates that it has four carbons in it, right? So butyric acid is found in butter. Um, it's also kind of stinky too. Uh, six carbons, we don't use hex, unfortunately. They use some other names. Uh, but it's caprioic acid that's also found in butter. And then when we run into the longer and longer carbon chains, so like eight through 10, those are found in coconut oil. So they tend to be even more solid. Um, and then if you go to higher and higher chains, you can run into things like palm oil, um, oil of nutmeg, um, beef tallow, olive oil, soybean oil, fish oils, and liver oil. Um, if you notice too, if you're ever cooking, typically the longer those carbon chains are, the easier they are to cook with because they don't combust, right? They have a much higher boiling point and smoke point. So um, a common uh, cooking oil that's getting really popular that's not on here is avocado oil. It's pretty cool to work with. So if you ever uh, get really into cooking, try cooking with avocado oil. It's just really expensive. All right, we've got a few more types. So let's take a look at other important lipids. The first one is a wax. And a wax is a little bit different than the triglycerides that we were looking at before. So let me draw out a common wax. So a wax basically has two tails coming off of it, off of each end. Both of these are nonpolar. Which means waxes really, really, really do not want to dissolve in water, right? Which makes sense. If you throw a candle in your bathtub, it's not going to dissolve, right? At least I hope not. All right, what functional group is linking these two nonpolar ends together? Not everybody all at once. Alcohol? Not quite. An alcohol would just be a normal OH. This has a CO double bond with an oxygen coming off one side. It would be an ester. So waxes used to be really, really important for um, our economy. Has anybody seen the new movie Moby Dick? Or wait, no, it wasn't called that. It was called like Heart of the Ocean. Yeah, yeah with Thor. <laughs> uh, it was pretty interesting, but we used to go out and hunt whales, uh, specifically sperm whales, because they had about 500 gallons of wax in their heads. Um, and so they would scoop out all of that oil and they would actually burn this as a fuel for lamps. It was a big deal when we um, started discovering oil um, in the US because that basically destroyed the whale industry and. Um, believe it or not, saved those whales from going extinct. Um, if you watch that movie, they um, basically hunted whales to near extinction and had to go all the way around South America over to the Pacific from the East Coast to hunt whales and then bring them back. So it's like a three-year journey just to find some of these waxes. Pretty interesting, though. All right, we've got one more important lipid. Does anybody recognize this one? Looks kind of funky and scary, but you might have seen it if you've taken biology. It's called cholesterol. Exactly, somebody said it's a steroid. It's, steroids have these ring structures that are all linked together. So you remember when I showed you bond line notation? Each one of those zigs and zags is an assumed carbon with hydrogens, right? So this has five different rings. It has a bunch of different groups coming off of it. Um, it's a really important lipid, and why is that? 
We need cholesterol. What does it do? Does anybody know? This is trivia. I don't expect everybody to know. Well, so we have it in some of our food. But what this does is it actually goes into your cell membranes and it provides some structural support for your cell membranes. So it gets embedded into cells. So let's write that down. It embeds in cell membranes. and affects membrane fluidity. Meaning if you don't have enough cholesterol in there, your cells are essentially too fluid. They move around too easily. They can be ruptured. They don't have the support that they need. What happens if you have too much cholesterol? They get too rigid, right? So. Not all cholesterol is created equal. If you ever go to the doctor and get a cholesterol blood test, they test for high density and low density cholesterol. Um, some cholesterol is good for you, some cholesterol is bad for you. It's important to check your cholesterol regularly because if you get cells that are too rigid, you run into things like heart failure um, and uh, uh, heart disease in general. So it's important to get that checked, especially as you get older. All right, I think we only have about five more minutes, so I'm not going to move on to the next section, but tomorrow what we'll do is we'll cover amino acids, um, proteins, and nucleic acids and try to wrap up the biochem section. If you ha haven't handed in your pod, um, you can hand it in up front too.